Uh, Calvin, I'll, I'll start with you. Should we continue to fund the Ukrainian war effort? So my, my problem isn't necessarily with the funding. I think we should support our allies, absolutely. My problem is that everyone's looking at this as a winning versus losing situation. And I'm saying, who's asking the question about raising peace? The only person, the only world leader I've seen so far is President Donald Trump, who when uh, CNN tried to back him into a corner, said, will you back Ukraine or will you back Russia? He's actually, I'm backing the people. It's the people that are dying. And world leaders all around the West are pushing for more and more war. And it's perpetual. And I'm asking the question, not how long can we keep funding this, but how far will this escalate? What mm. we're doing here is we're, what we're fighting against a nuclear power. So where is the aim for peace? Brooks, I'll, I'll throw it over to you, Brooks. You might, I know you, you helped to evacuate people. I spoke to you at the time. Uh, actually, this is an issue very, very close to your heart. I mean, Calvin has got a point, hasn't he? The longer that we do keep funding this, we are prolonging something. It does mean massive loss of life. It does mean a massive expenditure of the public purse, when, at times, frankly, when we could probably do with building a few more hospitals. Your views? Well, look, I mean, there's only going to be peace um, when Putin leaves Ukraine. Um, you can't have the sort of peace that maybe Calvin would like, which was to sort of give a little bit of Donbass and to give Crimea a, a way to Russia to reward them for their belligerence in order to have peace. Um, you need two parties who want peace. And at the moment, um, neither party wants peace because they each have a different view as to what peace is. Mm. I stick by the Budapest Agreement uh, in 1993 in which we... We, the UK, the USA, and even Russia, guaranteed, guaranteed um, Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, which mm. included Crimea, if they gave up their nuclear weapons. We have an obligation to stand mm. by that agreement. OK, Calvin, I'll bring that back over to you. I mean, there isn't really going to be peace, as Brooks said, until both sides agree on it. We're not going to get an agreement ever, really, it would seem. So this, I'm assuming, means it's going to run on indefinitely. What do you make of that? Well, that would be our position, wouldn't it? As the mutual third party, our position would be to, to bring both parties in to arrange a peace, to negotiate a peace. And in a peace, there is always compromise and, the, and neither side should be happy. The idea that there can only be one solution, and that, that solution is Russia being defeated, it terrifies me because Russia is, like I say, a nuclear power. And that means that if that's the only option, then we're looking at a world war. We are looking at, if we want to see Russia collapse, we, we need to see all of the way, nations of the West combined. We cannot expect little Ukraine to defeat Russia on its own. But the biggest problem I'm seeing here is just raising that conversation, raising that point. Has people going, ha, ah, Putin apologist, ha, ah, you mm. know, it's like we have lost all sense of nuance. I've been campaigning against Putin and against Russia for years. I do not see them as a friendly state. I see them as a hostile state. However, mm. I do think we need to be thinking critically about what's going on. I wonder, Brooks, whether or not, as time progresses and we fast forward a couple of years' time, assuming we're still in a similar-ish situation to what we are today, and I hope we're not, but let's just assume we are, right? Whether the British taxpayer then, if we start seeing a you know, crash in the housing market, our economy isn't particularly growing in the way that we would like, people are still struggling to pay their energy bills, we've got you know, domestic crises, OK? And then Rishi Sunak, if he's still in power, you know, hugs Volodymyr Zelensky again on the lawn outside Chequers and says, here you go, Vlad, here's another 2.3 billion quid. How long can the British public's patience last, do you think, Brooks? Well, it depends um, how secure we want to be. Um, you know, if we want to be subject to nuclear blackmail, which is, again, what Calvin, in essence, is saying, what we say to Putin in his uh, peace agreement is that, you know, we will re reward you and we will effectively uh, sublimate ourselves in order to not be subject to nuclear blackmail. If he is rewarded in any way, which means giving him a piece of Donbass, giving him Crimea, He'll just regroup, come back again in two or three years' time to take even more, maybe take Moldova, maybe take Georgia. Mm. At some point in time, we need to draw a line. In the same way, the Ukrainians have drawn a line with Bakhmut. Mm. Ukrainians said we could either draw a line in Bakhmut, in Slovyansk, or Kiev. We're it drawing a line here. We have to do the same with Putin. And the only way that wars are won mm. are with asymmetric wars. You're right. If the wars, wars are equal, this will mm. go on forever giving the Ukrainians the hardware they need to prosecute this okay. war and to drive Ukraine out of you, drive the Russians out of Ukraine right. is what we need to do. Just quickly then, Calvin, is it, do you think, really a question for the Ukrainians, even though it's these Western economies that are really bankrolling this, right? Uh, do you think this is a question for the people of Ukraine? Until they want peace, 
We just have to keep funding them, Calvin. Because, I mean, they've di- they're dying, aren't they? They're paying in blood, as Boris said. I would love to hear from the people of the Ukraine, actually, because I'm sick of hearing from Western leaders who have no input in the Ukraine. I'd love to hear from the citizens, the people that are actually on the ground, and both the Russian citizens, too, because it's the people on the ground that are dying, as it always is in any, any war when politicians are playing a game. And actually, the money is part of the problem, because, yes, there is a lot of money going into Ukraine, and I'm not entirely convinced all of that is going to the war effort, which is because the Ukraine has been one of the most corrupt nations in the world for the past 20 years. Okay, look, yeah, but, but, I, I, well, I've, quickly, I've, really, I've really got to disagree. I've been in Ukraine now for most of the past year. I've driven hundreds of thousands of kilometers. I've been to pretty, I probably know Ukraine better than most Ukrainians at this stage. I've talked to Ukrainians in villages, in towns, in cities, mm. and it is mm. unanimous. Unanimous. When I say unanimous, I mean close to 90% of people, you know, want to keep this war going. And they say, Anecdotes even if you stop though, backing they? us with, with weapons, we'll use sticks and stones to defend ourselves because it's an existential crisis for the Ukrainians okay. in a way it's not for the Russians. All right, look, both of you. I, 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 I respect well. you being on the ground, but anecdotes always are unanimous, so it's, it's, oh, it's worth right. a mistake. An- anecdotes over, over 12 or 14 months is not just anecdotes. Okay, it's chaps, spending a I'm dr- of, now I'm drawing a line in the sand. Now I'm, now I'm drawing a line in the sand. We obviously could have gone on to talk about this for a lot longer. I do really appreciate it, and I value both of your views on that. That was TV News presenter Calvin Robinson and former Conservative Minister Brooks Newmark. Uh, he has, of course, been over there in Ukraine, as he was mentioning, helping to evacuate citizens.